Because the film delivers so much, you know, it's not just a fight movie. It's a film that kind of really explores family and the deep dramas there. It's very human. It appeals very much to my sensibilities of like wanting to get involved in dysfunctional sort of like dramas as opposed to something light. This is definitely a film where the, the physical fighting often represents whatever is internally going on for all the characters. And it's a, a love story about to this weird sport, <laughs> their hearts open. You, know, you make something that's personal and I guess, you know, we're all not that different. I've had more people that are caught to me saying something about their father that related to Nick, or they had some issue with their brother that this spoke to in a way that was, you know, I had somebody come up to say, you know, we're, you know, we may lose our home. We may lose our home. As a writer, there it was fun to do because to let scenes breathe and actually explore character and, and theme. And to the studio's credit, they let us, they let us do that. It was painful to make the movie. It was painful for Gavin to shoot the movie with the time he had and the, and the resource he had. But when the finished movie is, as this movie is, this wonderful film, it's worth it all. This is what you try to do every time out. If you can find them, they're hard to find, you know. Sometimes when you, when you, there are like forces inside of you that you don't even know what it's, responding to or what it's trying to say. I just had this idea for two brothers that were estranged and were brought back together through violence. I was trying to satisfy my own tastes and smuggle in things that were really important to me as a storyteller. There's a lot of personal things in my own life that was applicable to that. My brother and I were separated when we were young. My brother lived with my mother, I lived with my father. So we had, there were similarities in regard to that, not the length of time that Tommy and Brendan spent apart. The idea of a father changing his life to cause change to his children's life was something that was interesting to me. So thematically, there were, there, were, there were things that I wanted to explore, and, and then the idea of mixed martial arts was something that I hadn't seen yet in a film. It really is the truth that MMA was exploding. People were interested in a real story in that world because that, uh, that sport hasn't had, its, it hasn't had its Rocky, it hasn't had its Raging Bull. Could it have been wrestling? Could it have been boxing? and the emotional journey of the film be similar, yes. But I think driving towards what I always called an, an intervention in a cage informs almost everything if you go in reverse. You know, Brendan saves Tommy's life by beating the shit out of him because they grew up communicating through violence. So, so they deal with the 14 years of estrangement between the two of them is dealt with in five rounds in a cage. And Tommy sort of spiritually has to die at the hands of his brother to be reborn, to live. You know, there's an old, the old adage, you know, write, write about what you know. But uh, what I used to tell my students was you just have to invert that. Real writers invert that. You just have to know what you write about. It needed to be authentic enough for your average, yeah, your MMA, lifelong MMA freak. It has to pass their, their smell test, you know? So yeah, we did get immersed completely in, in that world. Initially, Anthony and I wrote the movie to take place in Long Beach. I had the old man working down on the docks. That's where their world was. But once we made the deal with Lionsgate to do the film and, I, and we started getting into the way I wanted to shoot it without movie stars and the budget started coming down, then, it, then it, the conversation was, okay, we need to find a state that has tax, the rebate, the tax incentive. So we started flying around, checking out different places. When I got to Pennsylvania and I went to Pittsburgh, I was in Philly, then I went out to Pittsburgh. That was it because Pittsburgh just had this working class poetry to it that I loved visually. So it felt right vis-a-vis -vis what I wanted to do photographically. It felt right vis-a-vis -vis the characters and it felt right vis-a-vis -vis the, the sport 
of wrestling especially because it is wrestling country. You know, that Springsteen album, Darkness on the Edge of Town, which is uh, one of my favorite records, late 70s, but it had the same, we wanted it to have that kind of muscularity. Uh, thematically, it was very Old Testament, about fathers and sons, forgiveness, redemption, broken dreams, very kind of that blue collar American, and that's what Pittsburgh suited it. Let us trip past here. There you go. We only had six weeks to prep the movie. And I'm, I've never had six, I didn't have six weeks on my smallest film. And day one, I brought everybody together and I said, if we work on Saturday and Sunday, that gives us another 12 days. So now we're up to almost eight weeks. That's the expectation and that's what we're doing. Anything that he asks anybody else to do, Gavin's out there doing it first, which is, you know, a great quality to have in a, in a leader. The two guys who were side by side with Gavin the whole time, who never slept were Massa and uh, Jamie Marshall, the AD and the co-producer. They were incredible, it was amazing to watch. I'd rather work with people that are really talented that haven't made it yet and give them a shot because I know they're gonna work really hard and they're usually hungry. So, but they have to have talent. Massa had never made a, never shot a film that was more than a $3 million movie. Yeah, I've looked at his reel, we looked at it, and he's like, I think I wanna roll the dice on this guy. So I got him on the movie, and, uh, and, and he was great. He gave me a lot of free time. I tried to my house every day, broke down the script, storyboarded. I, I knew I had to be so precise with him about what I wanted it to look like because you're not reshooting a movie. You get one shot at it. So we had to make sure we were, we were speaking the same language. Now Masa, Masa is the, the DP, is to DPs now what Joel and Tommy are to male actors. Let me explain something to you, okay? The only thing that I got in common with Brendan Conlon is that both of us, we have absolutely no use for you, man. When I made Miracle, I had said to the studio, we need to find hockey players and I'm gonna teach them how to act because I'm never gonna get actors to play hockey the way I need them to play hockey. Warrior, there's more that happens outside the cage than in the cage, dramatically, emotionally. The complexity of the characters is such that I needed actors, which is even more difficult because now you have to have actors who you have to teach how to fight. The movie will live or die on the reality of what's happening in the fighting, because if that doesn't work, it, you lose all the verisimilitude and truthfulness of the film. So the goal was to find two unknown guys who had a certain vulnerability and sensitivity to them and also a toughness, and that was next to impossible to find. It was endless, we saw everybody. Like Tommy's character, for example, that kind of brokenness and vulnerability combined with that kind of animalistic uh, rage that he had, very hard to find that, it's always one or the other. But the big guy who could play the sensitive side of it, but he just wouldn't buy him as being a tough guy. It was really, I would say Tommy was the only one. I knew he was Tommy. I just knew he was Tommy because Tommy Hardy has the most important quality I was looking for, for Tommy Conlon. And that was this rough exterior, but underneath he was a little boy. There was a vulnerability and a, a genuine pain. And Tommy had that. My immediate reaction was, I don't think that I'm gonna be able to do this. There was a, I think the initial, the initial fear was the physicality as well of being an MMA fighter, um, which I have no previous experience at all. Not only is this man a prolific mixed martial arts fighter, but he's also from a very old American working class, you know, blue collar territory. Um, so there's, there's two transformations there already. And then accent transformation, physical transformation, and cultural transformation before I even start the, the story or the drama. So, um, my initial response to the film was, I'll never be able to pull this off, <laughs> ever. Live with me for five days. Somehow that happened. And uh, we started working on the character and I shot his audition. But I knew he was the guy. Tommy was, I can't, hundred, I can't tell you how many guys. I mean, it was getting discouraging. We didn't think we were gonna find anybody. And then the other part, Brendan. Three and one. Three more. Fucking Joel, man, Joel just, we, were, we saw a million people again. Uh, again, can you, you, know, you needed a guy you could buy as a family man, and then also as a guy who's ultimately going to be the best fighter in the world. You know how hard that is to buy a guy who you know, can fight like GSP, but he also, you, you believe him in a classroom, you believe him with his children. That's an incredibly nuanced role. Edgerton kills it. I really responded to him as a person, 
and to him as an actor. From the moment I met Gavin, I could tell that he is just sort of kind of filled up with excitement and passion for, for whatever he does, you know, and not just 100% actually, he's kind of he is spilling over with enthusiasm for stuff. And he encompassed in a lot of ways almost all the attributes I was looking for for the character Joel had as a person, which is, a, which is where you have to start. There's just a part of Joel that is this guy. I mean, he's definitely acting. It's not like, oh, Joel is actually Brendan. He's not. But, but you know, the, the, the soul and the spirit of Joel definitely lives in Brendan, and it makes you want to fight for him. But Joel also has a rough side. And I knew for the part of Brendan, I needed a guy who was living in his higher self, who was this guy who has changed, who is not repeating the sins of the past. He's that guy. But he's also a guy, when you look at him, you go, you know what, I could see he was a barroom brawler. He had that in him. And we all know those guys. So Joel had all of that. And then he had talent as an actor in spades. And then, which I didn't even know at this point, but I come to find out a little bit later, was that he had a mixed martial arts background. The only thing he didn't have, which was great for me, but probably not great for the studio at that point, was he wasn't that famous. But that was exactly what we were all looking for. So he became, he became Brendan. Gavin searched for a year for these roles and and I think in the in the casting process he would ask these guys if they would ever get in the ring and you know most actors the reason they're acting is they real life's a little too tough you know they'd, they'd rather pretend I know that's for my case but uh, so these are real special actors. Gav and I both grew up as Nick Nolte uh, huge Nolte fans Nolte's an actor's actor. He, he's to me. He's, he's a you know we call him the national treasure. Um, we wrote that part for Nick. He was always Patty to us. I wouldn't be in anything unless it's got something really dynamic to do. Because I'm not. I'm too old to fight. You know. And uh, I'm going to do something. Either it's going to be funny, or it's going to be shocking. You know, or stunning, or something. I don't want to bore the audience ever. I think for Nick, it was an opportunity to go to a very deep, personal, painful at times place, just in regard to his own, his own demons, his own relationships with his family. And uh, I'm very, very proud of his performance. I mean, it's a contact sport for Nick when he acts with you. You know, you know, you're in the room with somebody who's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna, you know, you're gonna be judged. You know, like uh, a new give and take, and uh, and he's a very live wire. You know, he just listens. You know, he's just there. He's present. I don't think it's all about acting for Nick. I think he's he just listens. You know, he's just there. He's present. Nothing's ever you know, premeditated, I don't think, nothing's ever the same anyway. He's very connected to his black dog, you know, his inner, his inner darkness, which, uh, and also light as well. He can swing between, between the two, and that's a very difficult ability to have a foot in both camps for, for a lot of actors, and I think Nick has that in abundance, just being Nick. And uh, from 8.30 at night till 6.30 in the morning, he was giving everything, whether the camera was on him or not, you know? And I, I think that's quite rare. Taz, I'm not gonna get killed. Oh, right, you're not gonna get killed, but uh, you know, promise me you're not gonna get hurt, you're not gonna end up in the hospital, you know, I'm gonna have no prize money, I'm gonna have hospital bills, and I'm gonna have a husband who's right. paralyzed. And... Listen to me. <sighs> Jennifer was the first one. We had two days of tests or readings, and um, Jennifer came in. I think she was the third person to come in that day. And this has never happened to me before. Undeniable. It was absolutely her. We, Gav and I looked at each other like, all right, well, well that's over. And I was kind of new to the process. I'm like, well, what do we do now? Like, well, we have to see everybody else. Okay, we'll go through the day, but no more after today because we're done. She just picked it up, put it in her pocket, and walked out the door. There was no doubt that it was going to be Jennifer. She can act her ass off. And I don't mean acting like acting, not acting, acting. She's just really, really good. It's just a luxury to, to be a part of a project where everybody's on board and facing the same direction. You know, it's like certainly there has been 
so many stumbling blocks, you know, logistically or whatever with the film. I know Gavin O'Connor's done an incredible job of navigating a lot of um, difficulties, you know, like things that have tried to get in the way of the film or whatever, but but in terms of the people involved, um, you know, everybody's on board and fighting to make it the best they can possibly make it. And that's just always a nice environment to be in creatively. Gavin, to his credit, and this is a gift that this guy has, the ability to to get people passionate about what he's doing and, and to get the right people. And he, every role in the movie, he's picked that person. And he's gone through a lot of people to get them. And he fights for them and he knows the right actor to put in there, and he's right you know, all the time. Yeah, you know, I've known Frank for, for now, I think, 12 years. When we were writing Warrior, I said to Anthony, I want Frank to play Frank, because Frank has a mixed martial arts background. I'm a purple belt in jiu Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I boxed my whole life, so I'm, it's something that, uh, when the movie came around, when Gavin said he was doing this, I was very excited to be a part of it because it's been something that I've always been involved with. So that's his great love is fighting and his other great love is acting. So those two things are like, this is great. So we wrote the part for Frank and Frank being Frank started doing all the work. I hooked him up with Greg Jackson. He lived at Greg Jackson. He lived at Greg Jackson's gym. Greg Jackson, who is uh, George St. Pierre, Rashad Evans, Keith Jar Jardine's trainer. Well, he's considered I think the most winningest kind of coach in UFC history. One of the best in the world, one of the nicest guys in the world. I went to New Mexico for about a month and basically lived with him and uh, and just saw what he did. He was part of the part of the whole you know team of fighters there. Got under his skin and shadowed him and got to be in the ring with the fighters and it was quite an experience. Then Frank took Joel to New Mexico. Showed him the kind of previous versions of the fights. <laughs> said, Greg, look at these and tell us what you would say if you were if you were watching these fights and that was your fighter. And Greg would talk to Frank and Frank would basically channel Greg. Okay. And then you continue to, to do your thing while you're talking to him. Okay. So you were going to give him two, say, say, we just saw that round. You need to kick him in the head. Hey, are you with me? You yeah. need to kick him in the head uh -huh. and then take him down. And that's all you need to say. Because Greg is actually the guy who gave us the idea to use classical music. And then you can have the coach saying, listen, calm down, calm down. Just listen, you have to, like, you're listening to the music and you can listen to me. Train your ear to listen. Train your ear to hear me. Train your ear to, to take that and calm down because that's an anchor. Exactly. You know, Greg's a funny guy. Like, you go into Greg's office, he's got he's got pictures of 17th, 18th century, you know, philosophers on his wall. Like, he's not your average, you know. He's something of an anomaly in a, in a gymnasium. Even little things like this with the feet. You know, people look at the feet, you nail them upstairs. That, but having a way to do, uh, teach that. Wait, do that again. So it's a drawing of the, drawing then when we got to Pittsburgh, Frank became Joel's, you know, sort of avuncular friend and also trainer. So now, whenever Joel was training, Frank always went training with him. And we would train together every day for eight to 10 hours a day with a great group of guys and, uh, and really got into it. I mean, he worked his butt off. Oh man, you know, if I never have to train that hard in my life ever again, I'll be okay with it. <laughs> well, the actors went through several months of training. Tommy and I arrived in Pittsburgh a couple of months before the shooting started. And we basically just lived the life of a fighter. And I mean, we kind of were all camped up with the stunt guys, you know, who were, you know, completely instrumental to the success of this film. Training Joel Edgerton and Tom Hardy was a, a huge undertaking. It started back in LA when we, uh, when we first uh, sat down with Gavin and they told me who they were gonna cast. Now I'd already known Joel Edgerton because his brother's a famous stunt coordinator from Australia. So he kind of had a background in martial arts and he's a surfer and he's kind of an athlete guy. So we had a, I knew I had a good base there. I'd done about 10 years of karate, but that, you know, I'd, I'd hung up my belt when I was about 17. I'm not 17 anymore. <laughs> the fights were designed where uh, Brendan's fights were lengthy and Tommy's fights were short. That came out of character, but it also helped a little bit in casting because Tommy was not as adept as Joel was as a fighter. So we had to get Tommy prepared for 
very singular, in a very singular way. Tom has no athletic experience before this movie. And he came, he showed up at about 162. And we needed to get him to about 185, 190. Uh, it appears to be 179 pounds, sir. So we had the weight to put on and a skill set I know nothing about. So I had to learn to kick and learn to punch. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Teaching him how to look like a fighter and interact with real fighters was, uh, was a huge undertaking. You know, so it was like two hours boxing, two hours kickboxing, cage you know, uh, Muay Thai, then uh, two hours choreography a day, and then two hours lifting every day you know, for, for the film. <laughs> one, two, three, one. One, two, three, two. One, two, three, three. Can't smoke me, four. The diet was, part of the heart, was one of the hardest parts. Getting, to, getting them to eat five to six meals a day in protein every few hours. We were carb depleting as well, so we were eating chicken and broccoli all day, nothing else, not out sweets. It was rubbish, man. <laughs> it was horrible. It was unnecessary. And I don't know why anybody does it for a living. You know, yes, it's exciting, you know. And getting in the ring with somebody, you know, who can tear the head off, you know, Mike Tyson, you know, is, is, is an experience. Like, um, you know, it's not, it's not all it's cracked up to be, necessarily. But I did enjoy it, you know. I think as, as time went by, I sort of had to, the gap got closer and closer to, you know, shirts off time and in the ring. And, and by which time there was a certain amount of like, look, you're just gonna do your best here. I would say the hardest part about the training was not having enough time. And you, whenever you take real actors and you put them in a real cage with a real audience and a real fighter, this is a very difficult situation. I mean, it's a very dangerous situation because first thing we had to do was take four of the most dangerous men in the world. You have Nate Marcourt. Nate Marcourt. Number two in the 185 pound weight division in the world. You know, for my money, one of my favorite fighters, you know. Eve Edwards, who is arguably, he's knocked out more men than Bowden. Kurt Angle, Olympic gold medalist wrestler. Now you have Anthony Rumble Johnson, who is one of the young up and coming fighters who I think will be one, a world champion within the next two years. He's one of my favorite fighters to watch. He's a, a genetic freak. I mean, when you see him hit the bag, we thought it was an earthquake. When we first came, when he first came in and started hitting the bag, we were like, oh my God. All of us are, uh, I would say, top fighters, you know, so they really pick some great guys to be in the movie to represent mixed martial arts. They're real fighters. So you put them in a real cage with a real audience and a real referee, and they hear the horn go, and they hear, let's go, let's go to war. It's easy for them to snap back into what they're used to doing. You have to kick and not hurt somebody. You have to take a hit and sell it. So the schooling for them was, wasn't MMA, it was how to become stuntmen. My team and I had two problems to deal with. First, train the actors to get them physically to look like fighters, and then teach them how to fight for film to make them believable as MMA fighters. And then to train the MMA fighters how to fight for camera and not wreck our actors. Okay, so it looks like, you know, from where he is, it'll look more like you're trying to hit him in the computer. These actors, I don't see how they do it. It's, I think acting is hard, but then trying to get the coordination for every fight down and not miss a beat is, is, is a hard job for them to do. Okay. When you want the elbow, yeah. hit me the first Just get on, on, on this way. Give us a little bit stacked. So <laughs> when I've got you like that, bang, yeah. bang. bang. And muscles in position, bang. bang. And then he's going to the elbow, hit me the third one. And, straight back. And, and let's just take everything up. 20%. It's very difficult not to hit each other. So punches would go through all the time, you know, like you know, an elbow or a knee. You know, Joel tore his meniscus. Um, I took a few weeks off. I tore the ligament of my right hand. You know, I broke my foot and I cracked my ribs. You know, like, um, and we were still fighting. And it was, <laughs> you know, it's like. Uh, I'm an actor. <laughs> this is too much. We've almost, at, at times, had to shut down, we thought, because we didn't have things that we could shoot until our actors were back and healthy again. And when you have one of your lead actors that's in 10, 11 fights in the movie, and they can't do anything, so you shoot all of those other scenes that don't include the fight work, and then you sit there and you try to come back and do it, You're, and you only have so much time before the, the movie's done and actors have to go on to other projects. This movie isn't like some stunt movie where you're gonna see triple flips off the top rope or, or you know, guys being thrown through the cage. 
what it is is what it is. It's real MMA competition, and that's the feel, that's the flavor that you got from the film. And these actors stepped up and did an incredible job. One of the difficult things was, you know, we were, we were wrapped up in sort of various kind of, um, you know, jujitsu kind of moves, you know, arm bars and leg bars and stuff. And these guys, their livelihood is their body, and and uh, and they're really kind of uh, difficult kind of positions for the body to be in. And when guys tap out, you know, they're that close to having their shoulder dislodged or their arm broken. So, you know, I realised just how kind of delicate we had to be with that choreography, because particularly like uh, Anthony Rumble Johnson and Nate Markor had fights coming up within the next five months. Now, if I, in my goofy, I'm not really a fighter, I'm an actor pretending to be a fighter, um, stupidity popped one of their shoulders out. Uh, I feel pretty bad about it. And then with their good arm, they'd probably just knock me out. One of the things that kind of surprised me, you know, coming into here, I thought, you know, that it was just gonna be more like a movie. And, you know, when, when we went through the choreography for the fight scene, and uh, you know the stunt guys and, and, and JJ were asking me, uh, you know, if there's anything you want to put in or take out or whatever, something that you wouldn't do or something that doesn't seem realistic. Gotcha. How does that look to you? One more time at 24. One more at 24, please, Greg. We've been able to rely on these guys to pick their brains about the subtleties, and you know who else has been a big help too is Josh, the guy who plays our referee, because that's a real UFC referee. There's a lot of stuff that's really close to what we get going in the cage. It's it's uh, it's it's very very close to what we're doing for in reality. Watching them on the monitor, they picked it up. You know, I mean, those guys are good. Yeah, well, the first week we saw those guys training, we're like, oh, they, oh, yeah, man. I don't know, they're gonna pull this off. <laughs> but they they got their coordination together. They got in shape. Those guys must have been working their asses off because we were watching them today, and those guys they look great, man. They they pull, they pulled this fight scene off that was, um, you know, that real fighters would have problems, you know, with the coordination and, and how it was laid out. And uh, these guys are really come around and uh, they, they're in fucking phenomenal shape. Talk about the magic of movies, you know, suddenly I'm like one of the greatest fighters in the world. When if I actually stepped in the cage with any of these guys, I'd probably be out cold in about five seconds, depending on how fast I could run. Just walking into a fighter in a rush while he's trying to get somewhere would knock me out. You know, let alone fighting one, you know, you know, those guys are seasoned athletes and uh, it's like standing in front of a truck. My actors have uh, totally impressed with them. Their work ethic and their attitudes have been amazing and their sacrifice for this cause because it's not easy. I know you guys are sore, I know you're tired, I know you're beat up um, and, uh, and that's just the reality of our situation. Um, the other reality of the situation is that we have got to finish our day and get through the end of this round and the fourth round. I'm just going to encourage you guys to just, you know, pour everything you have into this last day. Because this is our last day. All right? We'll be good. We'll be good. All right. Let's get it done. When I finished shooting, I, I hadn't seen all my footage because I was working every day. So my weekends were literally like, okay, now I have my actors, I'm rehearsing. I'm still scouting. I was still scouting locations in the middle of shooting. I was. It was insanity. I shot well over a million feet of film. I'm gonna look at everything. And on War Air, it was, it was, you know, it was even more usable because, because you know, Gavin, you know, he went to school on himself from the last sports film, and uh, he wasn't just shooting up, you know, whatever. It was, it was really, a lot, it was all usable. So it was a lot of stuff to go through. So if I didn't look at it at night and on weekends when I'm shooting, I had a lot of footage to get through. Going into this, I didn't know how we were going to make nine fights exciting. You look at Rocky, that's, that's all leading up to one fight. What they've done, Gavin and Anthony build this, this they, they make it two nights, and you have this sort of palate cleanser between the, the first night of fighting and the second night, and they're actually, those are big, powerful, emotional scenes that have been, that they're actually the payoffs for their seeds for seeds that have been planted earlier. No. No. So I think what happens is your 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 palate gets cleansed and and you're up you're, and then you're up for another night of fighting and what seemed impossible to make nine fights interesting becomes you know people love it. 
a very delicate film, especially the back end of the movie, frame by frame. If we didn't get it right, and we got it right, but if we didn't, I really think the movie could not have worked. I really believe that. So I, I'm very appreciative that the studio indulged this process, the length of time it took, because it was a hard movie to, to shape correctly. It's a real movie ending, you know, it's like, there's not a lot of endings anymore in movies that kind of break, like, it's like the crest of a wave breaks and then you're out. And this, this uh, warrior has that. The ending was really difficult because it shouldn't work. You know, if you watch it, it actually shouldn't work, but it absolutely works. I think people want every, I think they want them both to win. I think people, they know it's inevitable, they want to see it. They're rooting for both brothers, and but there's enough backstory and whatever that it becomes cathartic, you know, that the ending becomes, you know, cathartic and a release. And then that's a combination of, I don't know, man, the actors and Mark and the National and Masa and, and uh, Johnny and everybody. I think it's an incredible ending. As Gavin says, by losing, Tommy wins, you know? And uh, I think that's true. I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm proud of the film. I really am, and I'm happy with it. And, and I could look at it now and not only see uh, all the warts, which is sometimes how uh, usually you feel like you just see the problems or the warts. There's one particular scene I do. But uh, when I step back, I'm, uh, it was what I was. It was. It was what I was going for. I didn't know. I, I. I. We did it. Like what I was trying to go for, which I didn't know that we were actually going to be able to do. But what I was attempting to do, I can honestly say we did.